spinning, twirling, scoring, Steve Nash. He is some player. He is some basketball player. That triggers the rush the other way by Nash. Oh, <laughs> what a pass. The Brooklyn Nets' stunning hire of Steve Nash catapulted the Hall of Famer back into the NBA spotlight for the first time in years, which got us thinking about the legendary career Nash put together on the court way before Coach Nash became one of the most surprising phrases of 2020. So how did the South African-born, Canadian-raised kid become one of the best point guards in basketball history? This is the story behind Steve Nash. Born in Johannesburg to an English father and Welsh mother, Nash's family moved to Canada when he was only a year and a half, starting their Canadian journey in Regina, Saskatchewan before eventually settling in Victoria, British Columbia. Basketball wasn't always top of mind for a young Nash, as he didn't play organized ball until eighth grade. However, sporting greatness always seemed a plausible destiny. Nash's father played pro soccer, and brother Martin would eventually follow in those footsteps, even representing the Canadian national team. Former NHLers Russ and Jeff Courtnall, meanwhile, served as babysitters to a young Steve. While never the most physically imposing competitor, Nash's athletic dominance began to reveal itself at St. Michael's University School in Victoria, where he was a multi-sport athlete. Nash started turning heads in his senior basketball season, as the point guard averaged better than 21 points, 11 assists, and 9 rebounds. Taking home BC's Player of the Year award and leading St. Michael's to a provincial championship while clearly mastering the art of sports cliches at the tender age of 18. You're the favorite, how do you feel about that? Um, well, we don't really listen to that sort of stuff, we just want to come out and play our game. Remember though, we're not talking about the traditional American high school circuit. This was British Columbia, Canada in 1992, still a generation or two before the Great White North was regularly exporting basketball phenoms. We gotta see this. Murray is attacking. Look at him, go up. No, I'm not gonna dunk, not gonna use with my left, but the oh. English. So while Nash's numbers and high school accolades may sound impressive, the future NBA legend wasn't being recruited by any NCAA program. Then Santa Clara coach Dick Davey got his hands on footage of the Canadian guard, and the wheels were in motion. It didn't take a Nobel Prize winner to figure out this guy's pretty good. It was just a case of hoping that none of the big names came around, Davey told Fastbreak Magazine in 1996. When Nash arrived at Santa Clara, a private Jesuit university in California's Silicon Valley, the Bulldogs hadn't made the NCAA tournament in five years. Over his four-year collegiate career, Nash led Santa Clara to the tournament three times, highlighted by the 15th-seeded Bulldogs upsetting second-seeded Arizona in Nash's freshman season, when he famously drilled six straight free throws in the game's final 30 seconds. You hear about those stories, but not too often. You know, the recruiting network in our country is so very, very good, but there's one that slipped through the cracks. After leading the West Coast Conference in scoring and assists as a junior, and earning honorable mention All-America as a senior, Nash left Santa Clara in 1996 as the school's all-time leader in assists. Four years after being recruited by only one NCAA program, Nash was now one of the best point guard prospects in one of the greatest NBA draft classes of all time. Just two picks after Kobe Bryant's name was called, and on the same night Allen Iverson, Ray Allen, and a host of other future All-Stars were drafted, Nash was selected 15th overall by the Suns. With the 15th pick in the 1996 NBA Draft, the Phoenix Suns select Steve Nash from the University of Santa Clara. It was also on that draft night that Ernie Johnson let us know Nash had perhaps the best unknown nickname in sports history. Steve Nash goes to the Phoenix Suns. You know, he's from Victoria, British Columbia for a time, was known as Victoria's Secret. A secret no longer as he's taken in the first round by the Phoenix Suns. 
Wait, hold up. Victoria's Secret? How did that nickname not stick? That is one of the greatest sports nicknames of all time. Anyway, back in Phoenix, fans booed Suns assistant coach Danny Ainge when he announced to America West Arena that the franchise had just selected Nash. I don't look like I'm going to be a tremendous basketball player on appearance. I probably would have booed myself too, but I'm going to be a really good player and I'm going to help the team a lot. That turned out to be the understatement of a lifetime. But before Nash would transform the Suns, his career hit a few roadblocks. Joining a Suns backcourt that already featured stars Jason Kidd and Kevin Johnson, playing time wasn't going to come easy for Nash, who averaged 6.4 points and 2.8 assists in under 17 minutes per game over his first two seasons. Before he was even able to make his mark in Phoenix, the Suns traded Nash to Dallas in 1998 as part of a four-player deal that actually landed the Suns the draft pick that would eventually turn into Sean Marion. As recalled by a former Suns exec, then assistant coach Scott Skiles told the team staff, I think you're trading our best point guard. Nash was given the reins as the starter in Dallas for the lockout shortened 1998-1999 campaign. During that first season with the Mavs, his battle with persistent back issues began. He played through a vertebral stress fracture that wasn't detected until the end of the season. And it was around this time that it was discovered Nash had a congenital back condition, which is why you'd often see him lying down or sitting on the court rather than on the bench throughout his career. An ankle injury also robbed Nash of another 26 games in the 1999-2000 season. Growing frustrated with their banged up new point guard, Mavs fans gave Nash the same treatment Suns fans had given him years earlier on draft night. There was this one game where we were playing the Rockets and they had Charles Barkley and it was sold out. And at one point, I started to get booed every time I touched the ball. At home, Nash told Jay Leno in 2012 about his early days in Dallas. It was one of those moments where you're like, I can't believe this is happening to me. Still, there was light creeping into a dark tunnel. It was during that second season with the Mavs in 99-2000, Mark Cuban's first as majority owner, that Nash, along with a second year player named Dirk Nowitzki and veteran swingman Michael Finley, began to gel under the guidance of head coach Don Nelson. During the 2000 offseason, Nash played some of the best basketball of his career up to that point, in leading Canada on a surprising run to the quarterfinals at the Sydney Olympics. Nash gets it down to McCullough. McCullough against Tarlich, back out for Nash. 15 seconds in the shot clock. Nash gets a look for three points, and he finds it. Does he ever? A run the young Nash said he just hoped would inspire Canadian kids to play basketball. Fast forward two decades, and Nash's godson, the son of a teammate from that 2000 Team Canada squad, is just one of many highly touted NBAers from Canada, which boasts the second most players in the league today behind only the US. But back to the turn of the century, Nash nearly doubled his scoring from year four to year five in the association. And the Mavs jumped from 40 win lottery team to 53 win conference semifinalist in 2000, 2001. Then the real transformation happened in Dallas. Between the 2001, 2002 and 2003, 2004 seasons, Nash averaged 16.7 points and 7.9 assists on sparkling shooting numbers while only missing four games in three years. He also made two all-star teams and two all-NBA teams during that three-year run, while the Mavs reeled off seasons of 57 wins, 60 wins, and 52 wins respectively, even getting all the way to the Western Conference Finals in 2003 before losing a hard-fought six-game series to the eventual champion Spurs. Given how far both Nash and the Mavericks had come, how close he was to rising franchise player Nowitzki, and how much unfinished business remained in Dallas, you'd think Nash's 2004 free agency would have been an open and shut case for the Mavs. Instead, this is where Nash's career took its most unexpected turn, and its most monumental leap. A disappointing first round exit in 2004 left Cuban feeling like the Mavs needed a shakeup, and concerns over Nash's back and long-term durability loomed. Meanwhile in Phoenix, a 29-win Suns team brimming with young talent such as Marion, Amari Stoudemire, and Joe Johnson had significant cap space, a glaring need at point guard, and an up-and-coming coach with some radical offensive ideas named Mike D'Antoni. 
The Suns offered Nash a five-year contract in the neighborhood of $65 million with a sixth-year team option. Nash brought the offer back to the Mavericks, who were set to pay Nowitzki and Finley a combined $27.2 million in 2004-2005 alone. Cuban balked at the price Phoenix set for Nash, allowing the 30-year-old to walk. You know, every team has their own reasons. You know, we, we let Steve Nash walk, and it was the dumbest thing I've ever done. You know, and at that point in time, I was getting medical advice saying his back may not make it. Obviously, that advice was wrong. You know, and so we made the decision based off the information we had. And, you know, sometimes it works out and sometimes it doesn't. And whoever was advising him couldn't have been more wrong. In Nash's first season back in Phoenix and D'Antoni's first full season as head coach, the seven seconds or less sons were born, with Nash averaging 15.5 points and 11.5 assists on 50-43-89 shooting while flawlessly orchestrating D'Antoni's symphony. A Suns team coming off a 29-53 campaign raced out to a 31-4 start en route to a franchise record tying 62 wins that landed them the number one overall seed. Nash, Stoudemire, and Marion were named All-Star, with D'Antoni earning Coach of the Year honors. Phoenix performed 14.9 points per 100 possessions better with Nash on the court, posted a negative net rating with him on the bench, and went two and six with Nash out of the lineup, as the Canadian became one of the unlikeliest MVPs in NBA history. So congratulations, 2004, 2005. For Cuban and the Mavs, the hits kept coming as Nash received that MVP award in front of his old Mavericks teammates at the beginning of a 2005 West semifinal series between Phoenix and Dallas, then proceeded to eviscerate his former team over the most savage two week stretch of his career. Not tonight. Nash averaged 30.3 points, 12 assists, and 6.5 rebounds on 55, 42, 96 shooting in the six game series that doubled as his revenge tour. But he saved the best for last, averaging nearly a 40 point triple double over the final three games of the series to eliminate Dallas just 10 months after Cuban deemed Phoenix's offer an overpay. 111-108, Nash goes, this is three for the tie. Oh, God, Steve Nash again! 5.7, they inbounded, don't take a timeout. Dallas on the floor, this to send it to seven. Stackhouse, off the rim, we go to overtime. To give you an idea of how good Nash was during that series against his former team, LeBron James and Jamal Murray are the only players in the 15 years since to post three consecutive playoff performances with a game score of at least 29.3, as Nash did in games four through six against Dallas. To not be wanted back or not be valued the way that I was hoping for, I definitely didn't want to lay down and get beat up by the team that put me out to pasture, Nash told me earlier this year. Unfortunately for Nash and the Suns, in what would be a cruel preview of the years ahead, their 2005 playoff run came to a halt in the West Finals when they ran into the eventual champion Spurs. Stop me if you've heard that before. In 2005-06, Nash earned his second of back-to-back -back MVPs after scoring a career-high 18.8 points while carrying an Amari-less Suns team to 54 wins. Congratulations, Steve Nash. 2005-2006 NBA Most Valuable Player. It's still hard to believe Captain Canada is one of only 12 NBA players in history to earn the league's top individual honor twice in a row. But the Suns once again failed to reach the finals after a thrilling playoff run that included rallying back from 3-1 down against Kobe Bryant's Lakers. Their title hopes were dashed by Dallas, as Dirk's Mavs got their revenge. The Suns were eliminated by San Antonio again in both 2007 and 2008, despite posting 61 win and 55 win campaigns respectively. 2007 remains especially contentious and painful for Nash and the Suns, both literally and figuratively. 
as Nash played through pain all series only to have Phoenix's championship quest derailed by a Robert Horry hip check that caused a skirmish. Being chased, and they had a flame scout. As Horry sent Nash flying and Bell goes at Horry. And led to Amari Stoudemire and Boris Diaw leaving the bench and being suspended for game five. You know, we had a great opportunity there. I think we, at that game, uh, we tied the series 2-2 at their place, going home, uh, going home to, to regain home court. And uh, it was right at the end of the game, you know. Um, and then, then Romari and Boris get suspended, and obviously we play incredibly small, leading all of game five into the last minute, and they overtake us. Uh, you know, what could have been? Nash's last meaningful shot at a title came in the 2009-2010 season, when the Suns finally got the best of San Antonio in the playoffs after a 54-win campaign, but ran into the eventual champion Lakers in the West Finals. A series that saw Nash add to his legend status by rearranging his nose on live TV and continuing on like nothing happened, while Ron Artest added to his own legend with this, which essentially served as the death knell for Phoenix. Over six seasons between 2004 and 2010, Nash averaged 17 points and 10.9 assists on 51-45-91 shooting, recorded four 50-40-90 seasons at a time when every other player in history had combined for only five, won two MVP awards, and the Suns averaged 55 wins during that time. But the partnership never yielded a single finals appearance. Nash hit free agency again in 2012 and joined Kobe in LA as part of a signing trade to a stacked Lakers team that would soon add Dwight Howard via trade as well. Three years, $25 million is the deal right now as a determined push from Kobe Bryant helps trigger and helps complete this trade. It should have been one last kick at the championship can for Nash, but it would quickly become the season from hell for all involved. Nash broke his leg in the second game of the season and missed nearly two months, then missed time late in the season with a hip injury that also involved nerve damage in his leg. Bryant famously suffered a ruptured Achilles trying to drag a banged up, underachieving Lakers team to the playoffs, and Nash only played two of four playoff games in a first round loss to San Antonio due to the continued hip and leg issues. Even reuniting with Dan Tony, who took over for Mike Brown after a one in four start, couldn't fix things, as Howard proved incapable of running pick and rolls with Nash in D'Antoni's system. Nash was never the same, and after playing just 15 games due to injury in 2013-14 before being sidelined again prior to the 2014-15 season, his career came to an end. When I was with the Lakers, I literally worked out twice a day for two years to try to overcome my issues. Flying up to Vancouver for physical therapy and Try absolutely everything. Like, like, never worked harder in my life just to be a part of it still and to play. And, I, and of course, you know, you get a bit blind, you know. Um, uh, I remember Nick Young saying to me one day, like, he was my teammate the last year with the Lakers before I retired. And Nick was like, man, he's like, what's it like, like, to know what you used to do to cats? <laughs> and I was like, this motherfucker. Though he walked away from the game without a championship ring, Nash's Hall of Fame resume sparkled. More than 17,000 points and 10,000 assists, eight all-star selections, seven all-NBA teams, four 50-40-90 seasons, and two MVPs. Obviously, I still have a hole in me that I was never on a championship team, and I played so hard, Nash told me earlier this year, but I also realized, like, only one team wins every year and lots of great players don't get a chance to win. It can't happen for everybody. Perhaps the most ridiculous Nash stat of all, between Dallas and Phoenix, Nash ran point for the league's most efficient offense nine years in a row from 2001 through 2010. Think about how absurd that is. It's mind blowing. And it's no wonder Springfield came calling on Nash's first chance at Hall of Fame eligibility in 2018. Not bad for the recruit the NCAA ignored, the prospect who was booed on draft night, then booed again as a young player in a new home a few years later, and given up on by a franchise he helped lift. 
In the years between the end of his playing career and his stunning appointment as Nets coach, Nash faded from the spotlight but always stayed within arm's reach. He took on a player development consulting role with the Warriors in 2015, served as general manager for the Canadian national team, is still a co-owner of Major League Soccer's Vancouver Whitecaps, and even served as a TV soccer analyst for Turner Sports. Years before he retired, Nash also directed a 30 for 30 on Terry Fox, received the Order of Canada in 2007, and in 2010 became the first NBA player to ever carry the Olympic torch. Nash's reputation as a humanitarian and his willingness to speak up against injustices made him a worthy bearer of that torch. In 2006, Nash was named by Time as one of the 100 most influential people in the world, notably using his endorsement money to help pay for a new pediatric cardiology ward in a Paraguayan hospital. His 2020 hire in Brooklyn, during a summer of nationwide protests against racial injustice, fueled a debate about the lack of diverse representation in NBA coaching circles and front offices, and about whether Nash was given a job he didn't deserve over black coaches who paid their dues. Though Nash noted he doesn't believe his hiring is connected to those issues, and let's be real, he's not getting that job unless at least one of Kevin Durant or Kyrie Irving wanted him to have it, he also didn't shy away from the reality of the situation. Well, I've, I have benefited from white privilege. You know, our, our society has a lot of ground to make up. I'm not saying that this position uh, was, a, was a factor as, as far as white privilege being a factor in this position, but like, I think as, as white people, we have to understand like, that we are served a, a privilege and a benefit by the color of our skin and our communities. There are plenty of reasons to question whether Nash's latest venture will go sideways. He's got zero coaching experience and is about to take over a team with immediate title expectations. He's a disciple of D'Antoni and Nelson, who believes in ball movement and the power of the collective, but he's about to coach a team dominated by two transcendent isolation talents. Plus, legendary athletes who possessed otherworldly vision in their field of play often have trouble passing on that knowledge to others. But if Steve Nash's career has taught us anything, it's that those who doubt him are often made fools of. Whether it was booing fans in Phoenix and Dallas, Mark Cuban, or anyone else who scoffed at the notion an undersized Canadian with a bad back would become one of the best and most influential basketball stars of his time. Thanks for watching. If you like this video and want to see more content like this, be sure to hit that subscribe button.